Militaries from around the world gather in the South China Sea. Beijing throws another Olympic-sized tantrum. And video games are opium for the mind. Then more on this week's China News Headline. Welcome to China Uncensored. I'm Chris Chappell. For almost a decade, the Chinese Communist Party has been aggressively expanding its control of the South China Sea through the construction of artificial islands and bullying smaller countries using its maritime militia. Trillions of dollars worth of shipping goes through these waters. Plus, there's untapped natural resources like natural gas and oil. In the past, the Communist Party has met little resistance. But that may be changing. Warships from major powers around the world are heading to the South China Sea. The U.S. has frequently sent aircraft carriers and other U.S. naval vessels on freedom of navigation operations in the South China Sea. That's when they sail through the sea to prove that it's still international waters. More countries are now sending their own ships to the region, too. This week, India announced that it was deploying a naval task force of four warships. Those Indian ships will be doing exercises with Quad partners, the U.S., Japan, and Australia. Germany is also sending a warship to the South China Sea for the first time in two decades. The U.K. recently sent an aircraft carrier as well. The Chinese Communist Party does not like this. And my favorite Chinese state-run media, the Global Times, warned off the U.K., saying it was looking for defeat. Global Times also warned off all other countries outside the region, saying they should avoid accidental injury. Why did they put accidental injury in quotes? Your guess is as good as mine. Vice President Kamala Harris is traveling to Asia later this month. And according to a senior White House official, she'll be pushing back on China's South China Sea claims. Good for you, Vice President Harris. We're going to hold you to that one. Of course, countering the Chinese Communist Party isn't just limited to the South China Sea. Over in Germany, there's some spying concerns. Federal prosecutors in Germany have charged a German-Italian woman with espionage, alleging she worked with her husband to feed information to Chinese intelligence for years. Shocking that a German-Italian would be on board with working for an authoritarian regime. And speaking of a massive intelligence failure, Remember how, back in 2015, the UK let China take an ownership stake in its newest nuclear power plant? Well, guess what? Britain is rethinking letting China enter its nuclear power industry. Apparently, it's been hard to find investors who are interested in a Chinese-backed nuclear power plant. China's reputation with nuclear power plants is, after all, melting down right now. I'm sure while the idea of a Chinese-backed nuclear power plant seemed great at the time, not all that glitters is gold. Unlike the gold medal Taiwan crushed China to win, Taiwan's victory has also put into the spotlight the fact Taiwan's team has to call itself Chinese Taipei if it wants to compete in the Olympics. And when the Taiwanese athletes won, they weren't allowed to play the Taiwanese national anthem because that would hurt the feelings of the Chinese Communist Party. Of course, those are easily hurt feelings. The Taiwanese TV host is being harassed by Chinese internet trolls, the Wu Mao, because she called the Taiwanese Olympians national competitors. Yes, the Chinese Communist Party is that pathetic. Of course, the party always likes to point out the Olympics are no place for politics. Hey, did you hear that two Chinese gold medalists wore Mao badges on the podium? The Global Times even proudly tweeted about it, before mysteriously deleting their tweet. It might be because wearing Mao badges is against the rules. Now the International Olympic Committee has launched an investigation, because such gestures are a potential breach of Olympic rules banning political statements. An, inve an investigation? An investigation. Let me do the investigation for you. Hmm, is that Mao Zedong's face? Yes. I expect my gold medal in the mail anytime. 
Recently, China was hit by historic flooding. People were literally trapped in flooded subway cars. But despite this, Chinese officials put out an impossibly low death toll. Like, low for even the party's standards. Which is why it was no surprise this week the death toll suddenly jumped to over 300. That's triple the previous estimate. So, considering the complete disregard the Chinese Communist Party has for the lives of its citizens, you can see why over a half a million Chinese people fled the country as refugees over the last nine years. That's according to data from the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees. Hmm. That just won't do. Well, if China can get elected to the UN Human Rights Council, then I guess it's time to get on the Refugee Council, too. Australia is taking steps to counter Chinese influence in the Pacific Islands. The Australian government has approved a loan of about 50 million US dollars to Fiji for an airport. The loan is the first of its kind for Australia, part of what they're actually calling the Pacific Step Up Program. Hey, at least they're finally stepping up. If you'd like to know more about how the West is competing with China in the Pacific Islands, check out the recent China Unscripted podcast, What China Doesn't Want You to Know About the Indo-Pacific. And Chinese state-run media is calling online gaming opium for the mind, showing that they don't really understand how opioids work. But this is bad news for Chinese company Tencent. Online gaming is a big part of its business, and shares sank. The original Chinese article said, society has come to recognize the harm caused by online gaming, and it is often referred to as opium for the mind or electronic drugs. That article was taken down, however, and re-uploaded without some of the harsher language. This is part of a broader crackdown on Chinese tech companies by the Chinese Communist Party that's wiped out over a trillion dollars. And a lot of that money was from foreign investors. As Bloomberg puts it, for international investors, many of whom got burned by this year's regulatory onslaught, the old rule was that to make money in China, it was necessary to align with the Communist Party's priorities. The dawning realization is that finding common ground may be increasingly hard to do. Dawning realization? It's a dawning realization that it's hard to find common ground with an authoritarian communist state that's killing its own people and selling their organs? If only someone had been trying to warn people about the Chinese Communist Party for almost nine years now. Imagine that. That really makes me appreciate all of you for watching China Uncensored. And because exposing the Chinese Communist Party isn't easy, we also appreciate your support on the crowdfunding website Patreon. And as a thank you to what I call the China Uncensored 50 Cent Army, I'll answer one of their questions right now. Jory Van Leer asks, Seeing corruption is about as omnipresent in China as pictures of the great leaders, they must have a way to design with corruption, or at least around it. I mean, if the default is to botch everything and skim money everywhere, dams would burst the second an oversized rat takes a leak in the reservoir. But they usually hold out for decades. Ah, an excellent question. During the recent flooding, some dams in Inner Mongolia burst. It's common knowledge that in China, local officials often embezzle money meant for construction leading to what's called tofu dreg construction, structures that tend to collapse. As for dams, one Chinese official said more than 80% of the dams in China were built from the 1950s to 1970s, and many of them have exceeded their designed service life. And according to China's deputy water resources minister, a lack of financial resources means that nearly a third of the total number have not had mandatory safety appraisals completed. China has tens of thousands of dams, but most of them are not mega-projects like the Three Gorges Dam. So why don't we see more of these massive construction projects fail disastrously? Well, that's because these mega-projects are actually important to the Chinese Communist Party, unlike schools in earthquake-prone Sichuan province. Mega-projects are a way to show off to the world that socialism with Chinese characteristics works so much better than any other system. So that's why things like the Three Gorges Dam get more oversight. Of course, there are still potential problems, but the party knows a huge dam collapse 
could be a black swan disaster. Black swans are unpredictable disasters that could have dire consequences for the party. And I use unpredictable loosely here because how unexpected is the collapse of a poorly maintained dam? Thank you for your question, Jory, and your support. And also a big thank you to everyone who supports China Uncensored on Patreon. We could not do this show without your direct support, since so many of our episodes get censored or demonetized. If you're interested in supporting us, head over to patreon.com slash China Uncensored. You'll get a bunch of cool perks, including the chance to have me answer your question on the show. Once again, I'm Chris Chappell. See you next time.